So, a road map, what we're going to do. Um, and I'd like to, I, li I want to model the idea of in all of your writing, have a road map. Let the reader know where you're going with your writing. We're going to talk about a, what is a research brief, how it relates to the discussion paper, what is its purpose, who is its target audience. Um, then switching to the content of the research brief, we're going to do some active uh, activities to, to develop the policy relevant takeaway message in non-technical language without jargon. Then we're going to talk about the specific, uh, rather uh, preset, defined elements of a research brief, and then some of the details about how it's put together, and then the stuff we won't have to cover. Okay, so first, what's a research brief? Definition. A research brief is a short, non-technical summary of a discussion paper intended for decision makers with a focus on the discussion paper's policy-relevant research findings. And here's what it will look like. This is a template that was developed by Connor Bachtemann with Resources for the Future about 10 years ago. It will be three pages in length. The text will be about 800 words. And there, this is not an up-to-date template because it does not have all the current uh, centers on it. But the idea is it will be visually appealing. It will have a picture. And, and it's kind of preset. So three pages in total. Okay. Oops. So what's the relationship between a research brief and the underlying discussion paper? Um, three points I want to cover about this relationship. Contractually, researcher centers are obligated to provide one research brief for every discussion paper. I want to talk about the differences between a research brief and a discussion paper, which is an academic paper, a working paper. And then I want to talk about how, um, thinking backward perhaps to the underlying discussion paper, how a research brief can be based mostly on the introduction and conclusion of the discussion paper. A discussion paper is our shorthand in EFD for a working paper. EFD publishes a working paper series together with RFF. And we've just called, we call it a discussion paper rather than a working paper. Um, when a center uh, has a contract with EFD for EFD funded research, there is a contractual obligation to provide or produce a certain number of discussion papers for each project. Um, and the contractual obligation is also to produce one research brief for each discussion paper. These are working papers, they, they will usually become peer reviewed later. So probably the key thing to keep in mind is that a research brief is not simply a short version of a scientific paper. Everything we've been talking about for the last few days about concise, short, policy relevant key points describes the difference between a research brief and a discussion paper. For example, as Pete discussed this morning, a research brief presents the findings first and the background later. That's not how you write an academic paper, but that is how a policymaker reads. There are a lot of opportunities for the policymaker or her staff to dig deeper, but the first question is, is, the, is, are, is the findings, not the background, okay? Um, a discussion paper is, is a scientific paper. It's on its way. It's, go, it's, it's a step on the way to aiming for peer-reviewed publications. It's written for peers. A research brief is, is not. It's written for policymakers and stakeholders. Um, the policy implications often appear at, in the conclusion of a discussion paper or perhaps in the last paragraph of the introduction to, a, to an academic paper, but they are, they are the key to the, the research brief. They will appear at the beginning of a research brief. And econometric, all of the things that make your paper strong scientifically, econometrics, sampling, literature review, very rare that you'd want to include that in a research brief. So your discussion paper will have many, many references. In a research brief, as we'll get to a little bit later, you will put two or three references for further reading. You will put the reference to the discussion paper. You will put your contact information. And that is how the interested reader will dig deeper but you do not include citations. That's a really good question. You do not include citations to other scientific literature when you're writing a research brief, and you do not include a comprehensive uh, citation list, just two or three 
sufficient so that the reader can dig deeper. Okay? Okay, very good question. Um, as I mentioned, most of the material for a research brief should appear in the introduction and the conclusion of a discussion paper. S some writers would find it convenient to use the abstract of a discussion paper as a starting point for the research brief. Think of that as a time saver. When you're writing a discussion paper, think for all kinds of reasons. Think ahead to the importance of including the most important points in the introduction and the conclusion. A great time saver later when you write a research brief. Okay, so what's the purpose? Well, as we've been discussing quite a bit, it, it, the purpose is to communicate policy relevant findings to policymakers and stakeholders. Examples of how this interaction could take place, briefings, workshops, trainings, one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, it could be the foundation for other types of communication, such as news articles, as Leonie will discuss after lunch, blog posts, and so on. I mentioned policy papers briefly because there's this ongoing um, terminology discussion that's happened between, among EFD and RFF communication staff. Are these little summaries of one discussion paper really a policy brief? Not quite. I mean, a policy recommendation should be based on multiple sources, not just one paper. But if you have, for example, completed a three-year EFD research project and generated, say, three research briefs, that's a pretty good starting point for moving on to the next step of a more comprehensive policy paper or policy briefing. So who's the target audience, which we always have to keep in mind when writing? Who are we writing for? Writing is to communicate. Who are we communicating with? The target audience is a decision maker at many different levels. A ministry official or staff. Um, I'm someone who's worked in other capacities in my life as staff. I had never ran for office. Um, I wasn't the public face, but there are many people, many people perhaps with a master's level of education in, in um, environmental science, public administration, economics, and so on. And the elected official or the, or the appointed minister or the face of the government is relying on that technical person for advice. So your audiences are the, are the, are the, the face of the decision maker, the ministry official or, or, the, or the congressman. Um, they're staff members. And the similar sort of hierarchy of people in, an, in a non-government organization, a donor organization, a civil society organization. Um, other stakeholders who might be interested in the content of a uh, research brief include community groups. For instance, I know that in Central America, community-based uh, water delivery associations are important. Um, I mention utilities specifically because there's such an important intersection between private action and, uh, and public regulation. Um, there will often be meetings of multiple stakeholders dealing with the regulation of a resource such as water or electricity in which you'll have community members, business people, utility regulators in a room. That's who your audience is for a research brief. And again, some of them will have deep technical expertise in one area, but perhaps not formal training in the language of economics. So to completely echo what Pete said, they won't know what heterogeneous means, but they'll have a depth, a, a wealth of knowledge that if you explain heterogeneous, um, you know, impacts of tariffs in plain language, they'll be very useful. Okay. All right. So just think about why your target audience is going to take the time to read a research brief. Maybe they've asked for a briefing. Maybe there's a maybe um, a, uh, your your research institute is working with a ministry or agency to provide a training or a workshop. Um, maybe you're trying to market the, the, the qualifications of your institute to enter into a contract to do a program evaluation. And I like to always emphasize what's in it for researchers to take the time to do a good research brief. From that old movie that was popular in the United States about the space program, funding makes the bird go up. Donors want to know whether your research is policy relevant, whether you're getting it done, and whether they should keep funding it. Okay, so when I reviewed the sample papers that came in, it raised a couple of questions. One is that, I think I've got my slides out of order here. Let's see. No. 
All right, so sometimes you're writing a research brief kind of generically. I'm not sure who in the energy field's going to read it, but I'm sure somebody will. Sometimes you're writing it saying, oh, I have a briefing next week with a staff member. I'm really targeting you know, the specific question of Nairobi um, uh, uh, utility delivery as opposed to uh, countrywide policy. So you might have a specific audience in mind. And I got to thinking about this when I read some of the sample papers, and some of them were surveys of data from multiple countries. So when you're writing a research brief, you need to be thinking, am I generically writing, am I going to be talking to CETA or the World Bank, and I want to give equal emphasis to all four countries that I study to write this scientific paper, or am I really thinking that I live in Kenya, I'm meeting with, uh, with the ministry for the, for the nation, or even for the municipal um, decision makers, am I targeting locally or generally? So here's an activity that I would like you guys to take uh, in these groups that we've set up. <coughs> Each group should have at the table two, one or two, usually two, discussion papers. I'd like you to think about, take about five minutes talking with each other. Think about the audiences, the target audiences for the papers in front of you. Think about why that audience will be interested in the findings and how the audience might use that information. So the next thing, and this is really key in a lot of ways, writing a policy relevant takeaway message without jargon. Two pieces to this thought, okay? The, the focus needs to be on the policy relevant takeaway message. Um, and the other point is jargon and acronyms, they're an internal language, right? We, uh, most of us in this room, use a lot of the same shorthand, it's a great time saver when you're talking to people who know the same shorthand. But you can't do it when you're talking to someone. You might be working with some very intelligent person who's an engineer and knows quite a lot that we don't know, but it's not going to have any idea what, well, externalities mean. So, okay. So, first of all, the takeaway message. Here's the question. How is this research relevant to sustainable development and poverty alleviation? That's why EFD is funded. Also, we are going to do some practical exercises crafting a title and subtitle of a research brief. The bullet points, three to five key points, and the introduction and the conclusion. Well, some readers are only going to read the title and subtitle bullet points, and maybe they'll get to the introduction and conclusion. If you've got to get the key points out there, get people interested and hope that they'll get to the next part. Each of those parts, to the extent possible, in a few words, you're going to try to summarize the key, the takeaway message. It's hard to do. We're going to practice that. Um, okay, now this is sort of my, I've had some fun with this. This is the so-called grandmother's speech, although I'm quite insulted about that. I'm going to ask people, just so you don't get tired. Some people can't see, and just so I don't have to repeat myself, I'm going to ask some uh, people for volunteers to come up and read the academic version and the, quote, grandmother version, one at a time. So would you be comfortable doing that, Jan? And, uh, and um, yeah, reading the academic version. And Rose, would you be comfortable reading the, uh, the grandmother version? Come on up. Reading, reading out loud so everyone can hear it, because some people are angled away from the screen. Go ahead. Academic version. Yeah. Using a longitudinal data set in two rounds of surveys, we estimated WTA for PEF for land conservation. Okay. Right. That is the academic version. Um, um, Eugenia, would you read the so-called grandmother version, written by a grandmother? Um, I think grandmothers are awesome. Thank so. you. <laughs> Go right ahead. We interviewed 300 farmers to find out how much money they would want to set aside would want set aside land for conservation under a program called Payment for Ecosystem Services. Three years later, we were able to interview most of them again to ask whether the payments were high enough to convince them to stay in the program. That, thank you. That, in my mind, is, is the difference between the shorthand. I mean, I understand that shorthand because this is what I'm doing for a living. I would, I would not have understand that short, stood that shorthand 10 years ago. So the, this is another, another challenge as we're trying to write a very concise 800 word summary, but it's going to take more words to explain our shorthand. The he, oh, let me see if I can do the professor voice. The heterogeneous impacts of abatement technology on the marginal cost of production suggest 
that command and control methods result in suboptimal welfare compared to market-based mechanisms. Okay, the grandma the voice. Requiring all factories to use the same smokestack might be an expensive way of reducing pollution compared to charging a tax on coal as a way of encouraging factories to use less. This is because not all factories use the same production methods and therefore their costs are different. And wash your hands before dinner and eat your salad. <laughs> so there, the grandmother approach. So, okay, title and subtitle, and that I'm gonna ask you to work on in the next few minutes, bullet points, key points. The introduction, a paragraph introducing the, the research, the policy problem research question and finding. The body, the, the main story, the, you know, some background, a little more detail, and a concluding paragraph. So taking them one at a time, the title and subtitle, that's the newspaper headline that might be the only thing you read in the morning with your coffee. Um, the title should be about two lines long, the subtitle should be one or two lines long. Ideally, it should be a sentence, have a verb. It's not always the case, but that would be ideal. Um, the title should tell a story. Farmers say they would use more fertilizer if they could get credit. And then the subtitle can, can build on that a little bit. I want to give you a couple of examples of titles. First of all, can the title and the subtitle be the same as in the discussion paper? And the answer is not if the discussion paper title is too technical. So um, Pete indicated that he works with the researchers to write the title before the discussion paper is ever published. I don't do that. You just write whatever title you think is best with an eye to scientific publishing, but that may or may not turn out to be good for a research brief title. So let me give you some examples. Um, here's an example I like of how the researchers changed the, 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 the scientific title to a popular title. And it wasn't a terribly jargony title, but you'd have to understand some concepts if, if you were to read the title of the working paper. Community controlled forests, carbon secret sequestration, and red, plus some evidence from Ethiopia. Fine for, for a scientific paper. Um, the d discussion, the, the research brief title that they worked out. Even when communities do a good job of managing forests, additional incentives are needed to encourage them to store more carbon. Nice sentence tells what the story was, and then the subtitle tells where, it, where the study took place, Ethiopia. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice example of changing to a non-technical title. So one way I really like to use titles and subtitles to write a takeaway message is a question and answer. Present the research question in the title of your research brief. Present the key answer, the key finding um, as, as the answer in the subtitle. So here is a, a title, subtitle con, uh, combination that I think works well for a research brief. How do villagers want to receive payments for conserving the forest? Some Tanzanians want individual payments while others want financing for community projects. It's a little bit long for a subtitle, but I, I really like the way it summarizes the <laughs> takeaway message. So that's one way to use the title and subtitle of your research brief. So if the decision maker had this pile of papers on her desk and read the, you know, the title and subtitle, just some idea of whether it's important for her to read more. Here's another example, title and subtitle. Farmers aren't investing in water conservation practices that could yield larger crops. Subtitle, maize farmers in Kenya say it's because they can't get credit. <laughs> So the function of the subtitle here, the second part, is it tells where the study took place. It tells what the farmers are growing, and it tells a little bit more about the policy problem, lack of credit. So think about the title and subtitle as equal in importance to the bullet points as your chance to get the story across. Okay. The main body is about 600 words in which you tell the story. Now you're not quite so limited to just one or two sentences. There we, there's where you put a little background in. And there's where you tell about a little bit more about the research project, 
We sampled, seven, you know, we, we looked at a nationally representative sample of 500 households. We were able to look at them five years before and after a policy was implemented. Um, we were particularly concerned about the effect of children's need to fetch wood and water on their ability to go to school. You can, you can, you can talk a little more. You can, you, know, you can take your shoes off and relax and talk a little more in the story. Um, why was this an interesting problem to study? Who cares? Well, it was interesting or policy relevant because Children who spend eight hours a day fetching wood and water don't go to school. How does it affect people? Education is key to development. What practical solutions can you suggest? Well, we've identified some age groups to focus on, um, and we've also noted that uh, focusing on adult literacy or education can also benefit the children. Was anything surprising? Yeah, maybe it was surprising in that study. It was interesting that, that the effects of these chores were different on different age groups of children. Um, what was interesting about the ecosystem or community, you might want to mention um, with increasing pollution of water sources, people have to walk farther, or if it was collecting firewood, with, for, with, with decreasing quality and extent, uh, decreasing forest, children have to walk farther to collect firewood. How is this going to help? Well, in, in, this particular, in this particular policy problem, the one, of, the one about fetching water, well, it could perhaps help donor organizations or government to think about where to target scarce resources and what the benefits might be. So that's where you get, you get your narrative. I like strong images. So Edwin Muchapandwa, who's the, the direct, uh, uh, he's one of the senior researchers in South Africa, this story is, st this is stuck in my mind for years. Like There were 985 of this gorilla subspecies left in this habitat. Things like that stick in people's minds. The amount of post-harvest grain loss in Africa would be enough to feed so many people for a year. Concrete images, strong images, numbers, not in the sense of a statistical table, but children spend how much time collecting wood? That's going to stick into the reader's mind and motivate people. I wouldn't put that detail in the bullet points. I would put it in the body of the story. No literature review, modeling, econometrics, blah, blah, blah. That's not for the research brief. If the, if the reader's interested, you're going to include a reference to the full paper. Okay? Um, concluding heading, similar to the title, but mo just move a little bit beyond a shift between from here's what we found to here's what we think you might want to do, or here's what you need to think about. Um, finally, just the last few minutes we have before we get to lunch, this is just some of the nuts and bolts. You should have a picture. It could be a pie chart, it could be a graph, it could be a photograph, no big statistical tables. Write a caption. You know, children are, you know, here, you know, children collecting wood in Tanzania. Um, references. And, and this is, the, remember the template, the picture I showed you is going to look like there's a space. The citation for the working paper the discussion paper, two or three references for further reading. Some at Piotti at this table said, what if some crucial background information is so well known that it's not cited in the particular discussion paper? Like the killer in the kitchen, the, the fact that, I mean, all of us probably know by now that people die from inhaling smoke in their, um, in their homes from cooking. I had no idea of that until 10 years ago. So maybe some key background paper that's, you know, to provide background. The author and contact information. Um, yeah. So title and subtitle, bullet points, introducting, introductory paragraph, the body, about 600 words, the conclusion, a concluding heading in one paragraph, summing up the takeaway message and policy relevant findings, recommendations, references, picture, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's the part we've run out of time for. What I want to do is take questions and pass out a handout that's